Is Germany finally ready to make good on the turning point declared nearly a year ago by Chancellor Scholz? Breaking with a long-standing taboo, he has now authorized the delivery of German tanks to a conflict zone. Ukraine will receive Leopard 2 battle tanks, not only directly from Germany, but also, with Berlin's approval, from other European countries. And the U.S. is finalizing plans to send its own Abrams battle tank. Germany hesitated long before taking this historic step, sparking tensions not only with allies, but within the governing coalition. And there's still a long way to go before Europe's economic giant wields real military strength. So we're asking, arming Ukraine, is Germany a leader or a laggard? Hello and welcome to To The Point. It is a great pleasure to greet our guests. Jörg Lau is foreign editor at the German weekly Die Zeit. Carolina Vigura is a member of the board of the Kultura Liberalna Foundation, which publishes one of Poland's leading weeklies. And she's a research associate at the Freie Universität here in Berlin. And Gustav Gressel is senior political fellow and military expert at the Berlin Office of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And he joins us as we see virtually. Welcome to all of you. And let me start, if I may, with you, uh, Gustav. And Ukraine has been pleading for battle tanks with rising urgency. Is this decision a game changer for Ukraine? Will it make a real difference in the conflict? Well, I don't like the word game changer because uh, it suggests that individual weapon systems and, and certain technological advantages can bring the change in the war alone, which they never do. Uh, it always depends on the numbers, on the employment, on the kind of cleverness of the Ukrainian armed forces to bring certain capabilities to bear. But it is certainly good news. Uh, the problem with Ukraine struggling with other tanks that they currently have is that ammunition for these tanks uh, was increasingly difficult to find. Uh, and there were certain predictions within the army, depending on the intensity of warfare, the intensity of warfare is probably going to rise with an expected Russian spring offensive, and when they will run dry on tank ammunition. Now, Leopard 2s, Abrams, they go with NATO standard tank ammunition, so it's a completely different line of supply, one that we actually can control. So from this side, of course, it's very good news. The rest will depend on the time schedule that uh, will be delivered on the numbers that we can scratch together, and we'll see. Jörg, do you think the decision is a game changer for Germany itself? Schultz has repeatedly been criticized for doing too little too late. Do you think that's over now? Um, I, I tend to think so. Um, a lot of pressure was necessary to bring him to this uh, step to, to go to, to go uh, to take this step, but um, this is um, a long-term commitment, and it's a huge commitment because Germany will now have the task to to bring together this European co coalition of uh, Leopard users to uh, bring these tanks to Ukraine to su supply them with. Uh, with everything they need to to train the soldiers, so it's a whole package. Uh, it's not just this one system, and it opens the door to further assistance to Ukraine. So I think it's a it's a huge step. Uh, Karolina, you mentioned pressure, and in fact, Poland has been amongst Germany's most vocal critics, uh, both Eastern European countries and the Baltic republics, pushing very, very hard for Berlin to authorize uh, the delivery of these battle tanks. Is Warsaw satisfied now, or do you think that Chancellor Schultz's caution has damaged relations? The question is whether we are satisfied now or for now. In a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, we'll probably have a very similar discussion about other kinds of weapons. And then probably the same situation will repeat because it's actually not a game changer for Germany. It is a one part of a series of very painful game changers here in Germany. Namely, the, the, the collective emotions basically of this society, which is, sim which is visible in the polls, are against 
the, the uh, supporting Ukraine with uh, with ever more uh, weapons. And I do believe that what uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Scholz is doing is he's trying to communicate with those who are actually afraid. He doesn't want to neglect them. But obviously, because of his, uh, let's say, limited communication, being outside Germany, it's very difficult to understand that. And many partners do not understand that. And Warsaw, but also the Baltic states, also other countries who are neighbours of Russia, are in the same club of those who are not satisfied fully and who hardly understand. Poland seems to feel an immense affinity for Ukraine. Where does that come from? Do you think there's enough understanding of that here in Germany? I think that it came as a surprise. Well, first thing that came as a surprise was that a populist government who is uh, capable of trampling on the constitution in Poland suddenly started to behave very rationally in the in the international politics. And suddenly, which was also very, very relevant, suddenly it turned out that East Europe, Eastern Europe, has some kind of an, uh, of an experience which is relevant. It doesn't mean that Eastern Europe is infallible. Of course, we make mistakes and very often our definitions of the situation are also wrong. But in this particular situation, the, this, the, 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 the experience of the 300 years of Russian imperialism in Poland, in Estonia, in Latvia and, and other countries that are neighbours of Russia is very relevant. And, and here, from this perspective, we might be sharing something important. And we'll come back to that a, a little bit later. But let me ask you, uh, Gustav, uh, to talk about how this decision might be seen in Moscow. Because one reason for the hesitancy here in Berlin and also apparently in Washington is, con is concerned that delivering battle tanks could provoke Vladimir Putin to escalate. Do you think that that concern is justified? Um, I don't think it's justified. Uh, Vladimir Putin has escalated this war. He started it in the first place, then he escalated it again by annexing Ukrainian territories, annexing them, uh, even, you know, territories he doesn't even control. Um, then he declared mobilization in order to uh, force people to join the war and not having to recruit them as voluntaries. And we didn't answer that, uh, that escalation. We didn't kind of say, oh, well, if you do that, we're going to step up military supplies for Ukraine because you're not going to win yourself uh, out of this by, by increasing your commitment. Uh, that then was a mistake and we made now good on it. Uh, the Russians are planning a spring offensive. Uh, there are still uh, mobilized forces that haven't joined the fight in Ukraine and they will over the coming months, but that has been planned. We could have done nothing that the Ukrainians would have had a more difficult time fighting that off and all we could do something and then it will be easier for Ukrainians. But don't think that Vladimir Putin changes his game and war plans uh, just because there, there's this type or that type of vehicle coming in. Let us take a closer look at where Germany stands. Shortly after Russia invaded Ukraine, Chancellor Scholz delivered a speech lauded by many observers as a sign that Berlin was finally ready to lead. But the follow-up has been equivocal until now. February 24th, 2022 marks a turning point in the history of our continent. The Chancellor promised a special fund of 100 billion euros for the Bundeswehr. He also assured that Germany would invest more than 2% of its GDP in defence in the future. But almost one year after the turning point, the results are meagre. Of the 100 billion, just one-tenth has been spent so far, and the 2% target is a long way off. Hesitation and dithering, even when it comes to personnel, the Chancellor has been criticised for holding on to his controversial former Defence Minister for far too long. And when it comes to military support for Ukraine, criticism is pouring in from Germany and abroad. Critics say Germany is supplying too few weapons, or the wrong ones, and too slowly. But Olaf Scholz repeatedly emphasizes that Germany does not want to go it alone. After a long period of hesitation, Germany has now given the go-ahead for the Leopard main battle tank. The pressure was too strong. 
Is the proclaimed turning point happening now? Let me put that question uh, right to Jörg. Uh, Jörg, in the discussion before Chancellor Schultz finally reached this decision, one renowned Germany watcher, namely Timothy Garton Ash, the British historian, said that the turning point speech nearly a year ago represented the death of the old thinking, but that the, a new thinking hadn't yet been born. Do you think it has now? No, we're just uh, slowly, slowly getting there, I think. And this recent um, decision that we're talking about is, is certainly a major step, I think. Uh, it's a question of, of mentality. I mean, looking at our uh, Eastern neighbors, we already talked about that, and, and seeing that they have seen something about Russia that we didn't want to see because we were so entangled economically with Russia, with uh, our gas supply, for example, that came as a shock. And um, the change there has actually been very dramatic. I mean, we've cut off Russian gas completely within a year. People thought that wouldn't be possible. So now we have to replicate this kind of rapid change in a very uh, different environment, in a military environment. So that's, that's, a, that's a tough call for the new defense minister. Do you think in some ways Germany gets an unfairly bad rap? If, if, if you look at what France has done, actually it's a good deal yeah. less than Germany. Is Germany somehow not communicating well enough what, what steps it's actually taken? Well, uh, obviously, yeah. Uh, I mean, strategic communication is a disaster. Uh, even uh, when, we stay, when we take major steps, like the one now with the main battle tanks, for months and months, uh, the headlines are Germany's hesitating, stalling. The chancellor really doesn't give his reasons. Uh, only after the fact, he comes out and says, this, this was my plan all along. And that's not a way to deal with allies. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Carolina, because you talked to us about how you think perhaps in Germany there's not enough understanding for the long historic position and thinking uh, in Eastern Europe. But is that also true the other way around? One of the reasons for German hesitancy, and the Chancellor has made this very clear, is the conviction here in Germany that after having brought death and destruction down across Europe, and especially across Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, during the Second World War, Germany needs to exercise maximal self-restraint. That was a long-standing conviction in this country. Does Poland fully understand that? Yes, yes, uh, I think you're right uh, when you point at the mutual misunderstandings here. And of course, we can say on, uh, on one hand, the knowledge and understanding of the Eastern Europe from the side of the West is shallow. So we, uh, we jump to conclusions very often, right? So we, for example, jumped to a conclusion that Eastern Europe will be now democratic for all times and there will be no problems. Well, as, you, as we all can see, this is not the case. Uh, now uh, we basically think, well, the light has failed, to quote uh, Ivan Krastev. So this is also, it's, it's too soon. It's too much too soon of a conclusion. Now, as for whether Poland understands that, it, it depends on who, right? I mean, um, th such uh, analysis that the German society uh, and its mentality it's, is based on its own trauma. It has its own trauma, which is different from the trauma of Eastern Europe. Such understanding is, of course, among some experts. And of course, uh, when you, for example, uh, think about Hannah Arendt, which is widely read, in, 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 uh, by the experts in Poland. Hannah Arendt wrote after the, the Second World War that the social rules and the moral rules in Germany uh, basically were destroyed twice in the 20th century. Once through the Nazis, the, 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 the second time after the war was finished and, and, and lost and, and the morality would have to be uh, uh, constructed once again. Now, what is happening to this country today? It has been grounded on a certain idea of pacifism and now Germany has to say goodbye to the pacifism we accept that it will just evaporate we have to send weapons we have to accept the fact that wanting or not we are all becoming a part of this war and I, I do believe I'm often asked in Poland why 
do does Germany uh, uh, re react this this way, which is difficult to understand in my country. But then I, I answer that we also need a kind of empathy for the country and for its own historic traumas. Thank you. Um, let, let me go back uh, to Gustav to ask about a point that was also raised uh, in our report that we just saw. The defense minister that Olaf Scholz had uh, in office from the time he came into office until just uh, a, a week or so ago was a member of his Social Democratic Party, and she was seen as very much part of the problem. Germany now has a new defense minister, also from the Social Democratic Party, and it's a party for, who, for which these decisions are especially wrenching. Do you think this new decision represents a turnaround partly because of the new occupant of the defense ministry? That's hard to say. Um, generally, I think the new defense minister makes a much better impression than the old one. Um, the Lamprey's first and foremost um, preoccupation was to relieve domestic pressure, pressure for, for Scholz, but all key decisions were done in the chancellery. They are not matter for the Ministry of Defence. The Ministry of Defence is an executing body of some of the decisions, but it's not the key hub where decisions are made. Now, the new Defence Minister is uh, much seems much more energetic. Um, also, in his liaison with other ministers of defense, uh, there is good feedback. So, as now a big decision has been made and it needs to be executed, uh, the good hope is that somebody who is good uh, at this uh, may do the job better. Uh, but of course, we should not perceive or think that a minister of defense will wag the dog and 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 push the chancellor around. Yeah, Gustav said uh, in his first answer uh, earlier on in the show that the degree to which this all makes a difference for the war itself will depend not on technology alone, but also on strategy. So does Berlin itself have a clear political strategy that is now guiding it along this new path? As the chancellor presented his decision in the Bundestag, he was asked, so where does this stop? Are you going to send fighter planes? Are you going to send ground troops? Do you think there's a clear strategy and a clear red line? Um, I think there's no clear red line now. We're feeling for the red line with every new decision we make. That's what, that's Olaf Scholz's idea is, you know, let's just do this incrementally, uh, one thing after the other and see how Putin and how Russia reacts. And uh, we don't know if there is a red line connected to a certain weapon system. So let's be cautious here. That's Olaf Scholz's approach. Um, some criticize this as being too cautious, but there is an advantage with this approach that uh, nothing's really excluded except ground troops. But that's also uh, the, the, the view of Joe Biden and of the whole of NATO, no ground troops, no direct involvement of NATO. Um, but so it, it's, it's ambivalent, I would say. This is not a strategy, but I, I don't see how you can have a, a strategy in a, in a war like this that's constantly shifting and changing. Since the Ukraine war began, calls for German leadership have been accompanied by appeals for Europe to become a stronger security actor. Yet militaries here seem to remain in peacetime modus, more dependent on the transatlantic alliance than ever. According to military experts, the Bundeswehr has massive issues. Broken tanks, missing ammunition. Weapons deliveries to Ukraine exacerbate the problem. The biggest part of the turnaround, ladies and gentlemen, is still ahead of us. The armed forces, it must unfortunately be said, have often been neglected in recent decades. Despite a 100 billion fund, defence procurement is slow. German defence companies are not prepared for a Bundeswehr that orders quickly and in large quantities. On the other hand, the bureaucratic processes in the Bundeswehr's procurement office continue to drag on endlessly. On the European level, Germany and France want to cooperate more closely again in defence policy. 
To this end, development of the FCAS air defense system, which is to replace the Eurofighter and the joint main battle tank, shall be driven forward. These projects had been stalled due to uncertainty over funding, but it will be years before these weapons are deployed. Ailing armies, bureaucracy, national interests. Is Europe capable of defending itself? And let me put that question straight to Carolina. Is Europe capable? It is impossible to have a strategy when one doesn't have a definition of the goal. The only person here who has defini defined the goal clearly is, is, unfortunately, Vladimir Putin, who wants to destroy Ukraine completely. Perhaps some near to defining a goal are the, the Russia's neighbours who basically would like Russia to go to the German year zero, to be defeated completely. But then is it, real, is it, is it uh, realistic when NATO cannot be a part of this war? Well, per perhaps it is unrealistic. So, so I, I think uh, be, be, without defining the goal, even a minimalist, minimalist one, one, we will not have a common strategy. Certainly Poland has uh, heard the wake-up call. It is one of the few NATO member countries that is actually planning to go to a full 5% of domestic uh, pr national product in order to, uh, to invest in the military. Do you think that the balance of power within Europe when we look at security and military is shifting toward the East and the Baltics because of their proactive stance in all of this? I think uh, the balance of power or of leadership of or energy is shifting from time to time from one place in Europe to another. Uh, but so, so it certainly looks this way today that it has shifted to the East. The, 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 the question is, of course, whether the, the West is capable of listening and to learn from the East and whether the East is also capable of the leadership. And your Chancellor Schultz, interestingly enough, is now actually being praised by some of the same voices that criticized him uh, before for having made his decision on the Leopard tanks contingent on the U.S. delivering these Abrams tanks. So question to you whether he is right to insist that Ukraine's Western supporters must remain unified and essentially in lockstep in everything that they do and whether that illustrates the strength of the transatlantic alliance or the weakness of Europe. Hmm. Um, I agree uh, that um, the West should remain unified um, in lockstep with every weapons system that we supply to Ukraine. I don't buy that argument that uh, we have to be in total lockstep there. The US has provided so much. I mean, without the US, Ukraine would be in Russia's hands now. So uh, it's, it's kind of ridiculous for us to say, you know, if we don't force the US to stay engaged here, um, mm -hmm. and nothing will happen. I mean, it's quite the other way around. So, um, but of course, it's very important not to show rifts that Putin could uh, exploit. Mm -hmm. In terms of European strategic sovereignty, this is not a good story, I mean, the, this war, uh, because we're very, very dependent on the US. That's obvious. Strategic autonomy is something that Europe's been talking about for years and years and yeah. years. Do you actually see any change, any forward movement? No. Maybe there could be a reaction because of the disaster that we can't provide security on our own continent as Europeans to finally wake up now, but uh, that remains to be seen. Gustav, the decision on the Abrams tank by the US, is that largely a symbolic decision in the end? And could those tanks actually make any difference in the Ukraine conflict going forward? Well, they will, along with the other tanks. Um, but of course, there are, let's say, it, they will come later than some of the European tanks um, and they will have to be, be accompanied by more other measures and support measures for Ukraine in order to enable them to handle them. 
Um, which brings me to this whole idea of burden sharing. Uh, US not only does most of the supply uh, and military assistance effort, um, for for example, for all the rocket launches Germany has provided, America provides the ammunition for artillery systems, America provides the ammunition. We don't have that at all. Tanks would have been the capability Europeans could have provided without the US as such, and the US could and will have to concentrate on unique capabilities for Ukraine that only the US can provide. But we basically, for very childish reasons, um, have made uh, sort of this young team and now of course Republicans will have a lot of fun criticizing the Biden administration that Europeans as uh, again will consume their security at the expense of America. So so lots to talk about going forward. I thank all of you very much for being with us today and I thank all of our viewers for tuning in. Take a look at our YouTube channel and send us your comments.